<laughs> yes. Hey, everyone. Good evening. I'm Caroline Sanders. Uh, I'm Freddie Martinez. Uh, I'm a technology and a technologist and researcher. And I'm a designer and researcher. And this is our talk monitoring the alt right online. But we wanted to quickly talk about something else for one second. We promise it's related. Why do platforms allow fascist and neo-Nazi insignias, conversations, and celebrities? Doesn't everyone have a right to a voice? I'd like to quote a dear friend, Sadet Harry, who says, you have a right to be yes. a dick to me online. I have a right to not hear it. In this specific case, she's talking about harassment and her right to be in a conversational space of her choosing. So let's take this a little further. What about hate speech? Fascism is not regular speech, it's hate speech. It's designed to intimidate, to cause fear, and most specifically, if we narrow it down to the alt-right, to promote the, right, the, the white race. This is not any kind of speech, it's hate speech. So why do these platforms allow it when their terms of service specifically talk about harassment mitigation, not allowing speech that promotes violence? 
Hate speech is violent. More importantly, what is allowed to stay on these platforms and why? I'll be arguing in our talk about the processes for users. Platforms owe, owe their users legibility, the ability to understand a process and reasonings behind it, and agency, the ability to augment their experiences. And I think most people in this room would agree. And this is where transparency and transparency reports are key. Who is allowed on the platform and why? Why was Milo Yiannopoulos removed from Twitter but he's allowed to stay on Facebook? We as participants have a right to know. So that's what brings us to this weekend. I think, I think hope is a clear analogy for Facebook and Twitter at this moment. When you have a terms of service and you don't enforce it, it signals that that behavior is not only allowed, but it's okay and it's a norm of the platform. What is your terms of service? Or rather, what is your code of conduct and who does it protect? Let me take a second to dissect what went wrong here, Hope. You tweeted out a series of tweets telling attendees to report with the implication that we hadn't, we had reported. You then said we didn't tell security, we told the volunteers. I'd like to give you some free advice. Announce your code of conduct before every talk. Point to the volunteers or security in the room where attendees are where we should be reporting. Make your process legible. Where do we report into who and help me have agency? Enforce your COC. And furthermore, hate speech is not freedom of speech. It's a false dichotomy to assume so. As a researcher and a hacker and as a part of this community, I demand legibility and agency. <laughs> a little bit more. Tell me why alt-right attendees were not only allowed to, to attend with insignias designed to intimidate that they themselves were allowed to disrupt talks and harass attendees. Hope organizers, who is your code of conduct for? Because I'm not sure it's for me. Show me where in your code of conduct they were allowed to stay and that we were allowed to be harassed. So we don't just say this because we like want to get up here and argue about you know ethics and code of conduct. Like, that's not the point. The point that we're going to make in this talk is that online harassment and offline harassment are very much linked. And the fact that like, all, the all right is allowed to organize online has real world consequences as we've seen um, this weekend. And we want to explore that a bit further. And we want to teach people about how that looks on the internet. And we look forward to your questions. <laughs> but we need to acknowledge some key people. Um, so this work is not done by us. This work has been informed by dozens and dozens and dozens of people, some of which are named here. Particularly, we want to shout out Unicorn Riot, which is an alternative media collective. Joan Joan <laughs> and Joan Donovan and the media manipulation team at Data and Society. So this is not us doing this work. Uh, as well as numerous other researchers and technologists. So we wanted to, to acknowledge that. So we have a contact warning. Um, we are showing images, texts, and posts that focus on hate speech, white supremacy, and violence. If at any time you feel uncomfortable, please feel free to leave. We ask so you do it quietly. Disruption would probably be breaking the code of conduct. Uh, <clears throat> that's a joke. <laughs> uh, so. But also it'd be breaking the code of conduct. <laughs> So this is McLeod, uh, it's a plantation. Um, it is a historical slave building. You can see it's white and green. It's in Southern California. Behind this building, there are six short white and tan uh, former slave quarters. Um, so why am I showing you this? It, it was sort of, a, at one point it was a hospital during the, uh, the American Civil War. Um, in 2014, this plantation was visited by a young person who was radicalized online. Um, they were going there to celebrate slavery. They were taking photos there, smirking, and things like that. Um, on July 17th of 2015, we found out this person's name. It was Dylan Roof. Um, he went to a church called Mother Emmanuel and shot nine people during Bible study. And the reason we do this work is because this image doesn't show you really the whole context, but what we study is finding ways to disrupt um, radicalization online that leads to real-world violence. So what you're seeing here is actually pulled from uh, the alt-right subreddit before it was taken down by Reddit. And it's important to sort of break down what is the alt-right. It's a disparate ideology of, of the far right whose primary analysis of the world is through identity politics, or rather, the opposite of identity politics. It's about the preservation of white identity and white nationalism and white supremacy. 
For these reasons, it is closely aligned with traditional neo-Nazi and fascist ideology, and they can share overlapping goals. Um, but one thing we want to point out is we're, we're analyzing a bunch of different data sets, and it's, it is important to acknowledge that the size of the data set is maybe not, uh, should not be corroborated to the size of the members, meaning you can be on an alt-right subreddit and not actually be a member of the alt-right. Rather, what we're studying, studying is the language used by the alt-right, the memes, the specific kind of vernacular that starts to arise. We're interested in the veracity of the information, um, not necessarily the volume. Because context is important. This is a screenshot of vote uh, subreddit, or it's a Reddit clone uh, from May 10th. And what you're seeing is different kinds of veiled languages. What you're also seeing is norm setting and norm creation. Uh, we have an example of evil, evil Jews in relation to globalists. You're seeing a discussion of current events, uh, Trump jokes, etc. And this is the alt-right version of Reddit. This is where a lot of uh, congregation happens. And this is important because a lot of this talk is sort of talking about normalization. And here we have the New York Times normalizing uh, a very well-known neo-Nazi, uh, Matt Heimbeck and his family. And this, in fact, is pretty much, I would say, giving fascists more of a platform. When you start to normalize people of the alt-right, it makes them, it's, it's changing norm setting. Um, Matt Heimbeck was recently released after violating his parole when he attacked his wife during a domestic dispute. The parole violation actually stemmed from him attacking a black woman during a, a Trump rally in Texas. His group, the Traditional Workers Party, was also part of the Charlottesville attacks on August 12, 2017. As we can see, the New York Times is not alone. I want to talk a little bit about the history of online harassment, specifically 4chan, 8chan, and Reddit. So there is this harassment campaign called Gamergate. How many of you have heard of it? Yeah, lots of hairs. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> If you haven't heard of it, I am also sorry that I have to tell you about it. It was an online harassment campaign coming out of the game scene. Uh, there is a lot of really, there's a whole interesting ethnography on it, which I done, and I can talk to you later about that. But the kind of end goal was to push out identity politics and social justice, and it targeted mainly women and people of color. But what's fascinating here is we actually saw some of the beginnings of the digital tactics used by the alt-right. Um, and Gamergate itself actually was built on previous 4chan, 8chan harassment campaigns. One example was called Operation Lollipop, which was different people coordinating on 4chan to imitate women of color. On Twitter, uh, they created fake profiles. They then created a hashtag campaign called In, In Father's Day and then used this to try to attack actual women of color feminists to try to create divisions inside of a subculture on Twitter. These, these, attack, these attacks, these campaigns were coordinated and planned on multiple platforms. This is important because this allows us to sort of start tracing the lineage of practicing coordinated attacks. And this is something that Gamergate also did as well. These are the different spaces that Gamergate has congregated in. Um, we see board sites, so 4chan, 8chan, Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, GitLab for uh, archiving all of their work. I believe it's still up, so you can see that they have an entire archive of everything they've done. Uh, journalism sites like Brett Bart and you have blogs and platforms. It's not really that different from the alt-right. And I think this is kind of important that um, when you start to look at the nexus of where these spaces are planned, like where the coordination and planning is happening. This is important because it means that we can look at it. A lot of these spaces are actually fairly open. A lot of the different boards are still public. So we wanted to show this meme. Um, it's called the Happy Merchant. It's sort of an anti-Semitic caricature of what a Jewish person would look like. Um, this, m this original meme, it's obviously highly anti-Semitic, highly racist. It appeared on uh, 4chan after another uh, 4chan board poll uh, was found to be too racist and sexist. And it's a very well-known um, sort of image that's among the alt-right. And the reason we show this is to show some of the lineage um, from 4chan to other sites. So this. It's also a meme that's used a lot by, uh, with the Daily Stormer, a neo-Nazi blog. Um, so this is a happy mer merchant meme of Anita Sarkeesian. Um, a couple years ago, I was a, a designer in residence uh, between IBM and Arts and Technology Center in New York and BuzzFeed, uh, a online journalism site. And I was talking to a journalist about ethnography. And uh, side note, this whole talk is pretty much like why we should all do ethnography. Um, <laughs> And I was trying to explain why I was spending hours and hours reading Vote and 4chan and 8chan looking at neo-Nazi blogs. This reporter asked me, why don't you just scrape everything? Like scrape everything and then sort through it at first. And so I had him open up Vote and I asked him what he saw. We went to the Vote slash Identitarian, which is where the alt-right at the time was writing. 
And he's like, I don't know, I see, I see just like a front page. And I was like, well, let me tell you what I see. I see like half the articles here, or half the URLs here are articles to other places and people are talking about them. But what's really interesting is I see two of the subvotes that are starting, they're talking about people. Let's click on one of them. One of them was this picture of Anita Sarkeesian. This is the only image at the time that ever popped up of Anita Sarkeesian. There was maybe three threads that were going. Um, so it wasn't high velocity, right? There wasn't a lot of interaction. But what's fascinating about this was in particular, and this is what I told the reporter, is that they didn't need to explain that this was Anita Sarkeesian. They didn't need to give any background. They didn't need to say who it was. Everyone knew in the subvote that was commenting on this who, who this person was. Why is this important? Well, it means that she's iconic to this group. It means that she's so a part of their vernacular and, and the lexical graph of the alt-right that she doesn't need to be explained. This is an in-joke. And I found that to be really, really fascinating. And so this idea of in-jokes and words and vocabulary that exists pretty much to the alt-right is a basis of a lot of my work to where I made a hate speech dictionary. Uh, I've been working on this for a couple years and I'm about to republish it in the next couple months. But again, what I was aiming for here was kind of a saturation point of knowledge. I wanted to know what they were talking about. I wouldn't be able to get all of this just from scraping uh, different sites. I had to sit there and read it and look at the comments that existed around these words. I needed to see how often certain memes reappeared and appeared and how they were used and then reused. I needed to then see blogs that they were reading to sort of confirm what these memes meant. You don't necessarily get a lot of that from big data analysis or just from scraping alone. You really do have to understand the norms and the contextualization of this. And what I was really aiming for is what Trisha Wang, an ethnographer, calls thick data or insights drawn from the way that people actually talked act and interact. And Reddit is a great place to do this, to observe the norms of a community with its upvoting, downvoting, threaded, comments, subreddits, and posts. Its infrastructure can quickly reveal what a community finds popular. This led me to writing an article called There's an Alt-Right Version of Everything. I think that this is really important. What I noticed um, when I was writing this article six, uh, six or eight months ago was uh, some journalists were talking about how the alt-right had moved to the dark web. I think what they admit is that the alt-right had moved to other websites. <laughs> and I find that really fascinating because we in this room know that the dark web is a real place. <laughs> it's a real thing. It's not unvisited websites. What, what other researchers were... were <laughs> um, what, what actually was happening is that the alt-right's on the clear web, right? They're on the filter net, but they're just on websites that we don't go to. They're not on Patreon. They're on Patreon. That's a real crowdsourcing website that they're on. They're not on Reddit. They're on Vote. Um, they're on websites like this. They're not on Twitter. They're on Gab, right? They're not on YouTube. They're on PewTube. They've made their own versions of these sites. But these sites are not dot .onion services, right? They're actually, well, we can all visit them today. I think that's really important to point out. Please don't. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So uh, another thing that's happened on the internet is a lot of websites have um, started moving sort of neo-Nazi content offline. So GoDaddy, U Cloudflare, um, other big providers that have, that have been yelled at for years have started dropping this content. Um, and this is really important to point out because this makes it harder for the alt-right to stay online, to stay in big public spaces. And um, there's often an argument of, well, it'll force them to go other places. I then invite you to look at the amount of traffic on vote or how much money Gab can fundraise. When they're not allowed to stay in certain places that we're congregating in, they're forced to go other places, it's actually still hard for those places to stay up, right? It's very hard for Gab to keep fundraising money. Vote has not a lot of traffic. Any friction here is good and necessary. Um, and this is also still another example. Um, and again, sort of building up what I previously said, the alt-right can use or was using spaces like Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook to recruit. It's not a hyperbole when people ask Jack to ban the Nazis. And this example is really important. It seems like tech companies keep bending over backwards to try to keep this toxic content online. And there could be a variety of reasons. Maybe it's a misunderstanding around the First Amendment, um, or maybe they just want to have platforms that are constantly engaging. Um, here's another example from Facebook. Um, and I wanted to highlight one particular example from YouTube. This is from this thing called Fashwave. It is sort of vaporwave infused with fascist ideologies. So they take pixelated art, high neon um, 
sort of highly neon uh, colors and things like that, and they um, use that to make art. So here's 30 seconds from this thing, from this artist called SS Soldatin. They use a, so, uh, sorry, it's Brief called. content warning. Brief content warning, yeah, appreciate it. They use a sunrod, which is a black sun, which is a major sort of Nazi symbol, um, and this is what they want people to listen to when they're programming. So that's what people, they want people to listen to. Um, another thing that the all right does is they look at current events. Here is a uh, gif of Mike Pence electrocuting queer people. This was their inside joke. Um, uh, we found this photo um, in March of 2017. And um, one of the memes that was happening in the all right during the time was Mike Pence is based. And his version of being based is that he likes to electrocute queer people. Um, and that's important because when I found this GIF, I was like, what is going on here? And it became apparent much later when um, this is a headline from October of 2017 of Trump talking about Mike Pence wanting to hang gay people. Um, so what's important here is the memeing and the re-memeing of sort of current political events. So if you want to do this research, you really, like, as much as I hate you know, the pain box of opening my phone and reading Twitter every day. Uh, you do, if you want to do this research, you do have to really understand sort of the entire political climate. Um, so as an example, um, this is another happy merchant. It's, it's very hard to see, but each of the sub images are anime characters. And one of the things that's very popular in the alt-right is using um, anime characters sort of with like Make America Great hats or things like that. Um, and boosting sort of some of the rhetoric of the Trump campaign. It's not directly linked, but there's a lot of memeing and re-imaging and re-memeing of previous content. So if you just look at that Mike Pence electrocuting a queer person um, gif, you won't actually get the full context until you see the stuff that happens eight months later. <clears throat> um, so to talk about the all right, we have to talk about major groups. Um, in the top left is the Traditional Workers' Party, which uh, is led by Matt Heimbeck, which we talked about. Um, there is another nebulous group that's called the Anti-Communist Action, which is in the middle right. They're actually not so much an organized group as they are sort of a clearinghouse for other alt-right people. In the bottom left, we have uh, Adam Waffen Division. Um, if you don't speak German, uh, Adam Waffen is atomic weapon. Um, so they're more traditionally aligned with actual regular neo-Nazi groups, but the reason we include them here is because there's a lot of fluidity between these members. Um, in the middle, there's Identity Europa, which is very popular with these, this idea of identitarianism, which is very well regarded in sort of um, mostly European groups, but they are active in the US as well. Um, and on the far right, uh, not, that's not a joke. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's actually two groups. They, they actually splintered at one point. Um, there's a Patriot Front, uh, which is another young group of people, and Vanguard America, uh, which is on the bottom right. Um, so they're, they're interesting to know about because they actually were a part of a larger group that eventually split. Um, so we have a brief content warning. Uh, this is showing violence from Charlottesville, specifically the car going into the crowd. Um, so Vanguard America had one of their members um, marching with their shields um, during Charlottesville, attacking people, um, uh, posting on um, alt-right uh, social media accounts and text messages that the DOJ has recovered now. Um, eventually, um, driving their car through the crowd uh, and killing how they're higher. So uh, the reason we study this is because like, it might look like it's, they're just online, but that's not the case. 
So again, as Freddie mentioned, offline offline violence, I think we can we can start to link it to online harassment. In February 2017, someone calling themselves Dr. Piss was passing around links in a server called Pony Power. We watched as they coordinated honeypots, talked about spear phishing and hacking people, and organized doxing campaigns. This is from this is from September 2017 article by Michael Lee in The Intercept. And we wouldn't be at a hacker conference without talking about Bitcoin. So this is a project from uh, John Babinek. He's a security researcher out of Illinois. Um, he analyzes Bitcoin transactions uh, to see transactions on the alt-right to different alt-right uh, wallets, right? Um, so what he does is he just scrapes the Bitcoin ledger and uh, tweets about it. Um, <clears throat> so why do Nazis like Bitcoin? They like it because it's, they've been locked out of the traditional money markets. Uh, they can't get through a credit card processor, um, so they go to Coinbase or something like that. They love it because it's anonymous and largely unregulated, and a lot of their assets are tied up in lawsuits, so they actually can't move a lot of their money around. Um, the reason we love Bitcoin is because everything is public, <laughs> it's not anonymous. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> But also, like, um, in, in this screenshot, some person has, like, $70,000 sitting in their Bitcoin uh, address. And a lot of the times, they're, you know, always like, I need crypto, I need crypto, I need crypto. And uh, it, it, it is helpful to show, like, how much money they actually have. And people, like, have started not giving them money. So this is this is showing uh, someone sending fourteen dollars and or sorry fourteen and eighty eight Bitcoin to Andrew Eaglin. Uh, Andrew England is the founder of Stormfront or the Daily Stormer, sorry, which is a ma major forum for the alt right and white supremacists. But what's really fascinating about this is the numbers fourteen and eighty eight. So this is these are very common white supremacy tropes. Fourteen refers to the most popular, or refers to the 14 words, the most popular white supremacy slogan in the world. And 88 actually refers to the letter H, it's the eighth letter in the alphabet, and 88 is standing for Heil Hitler. Um, the 14 words are, we must secure the existence of our people and for a future of white children. So what we're seeing here is also just that reference um, in, this, uh, in this Bitcoin transaction. Um, and what's also really important to point out at the time of this, uh, Bitcoin was, or f it, Bitcoin was worth about f uh, four, $4,000 per BTC. Coincidentally, actually, after Charlottesville, the price of Bitcoin exploded, eventually getting up to almost $20,000 per BTC. Um, so lastly, this money was also sent eight days after the murder of Heather Hare on August 12th, 2017. And as Freddie mentioned, following this money is really important. Um, but also, I think, I think this also, again, shows how we can create or start thinking about the ways that products can sort of fit in as deterrents to fascists. I mean, you know, like, Richard Spencer shouldn't even be allowed to order a fucking drink at a bar, right? <laughs> and he can't! <laughs> <laughs> and this is exactly what happened here. His credit card was declined while ordering a single bourbon, and he was promptly banned for life from that bar. Uh... <laughs> And, you know, what's interesting about this one is that the bartender was like, or the manager was like, I wouldn't do that to anyone, but it's fucking Richard Spencer. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, but following the money, another uh, thing that you can do is Venmo's transactions are public by default. So here's another person um, organizing out of Charlottesville uh, who is getting money or is at least friends with uh, Nathan D'Amigo, who is one of the head people of Identity Europa, so we can fo follow their money around as they like say like, yo, th gas money. Um, that's really helpful. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, so another thing that we've been monitoring is the use of this book, Siege. So for people that don't know, Siege is a major a uh, neo-Nazi book by this guy, uh, James Mason. The entire idea of Siege is that uh, one of the ideas is creating insurrection through, they, they want to ferment a, a race war, and the way that you do that is committing random acts of violence against, um, you know, undesirables, as, as they call it. Um, this book has been leaked to at least, uh, well, this book is very popular, and in fact is the book you have to read if you want to become a part of Adam Waffen Division. Um, it has been, and they have been linked to at least five murders. Um, 
they have uh, they are very well regarded in the alt right. So even though they are maybe outside of the alt right, there is a lot of fluidity in these groups. So like even though they've committed five murders and um, even one of their members w was arrested with like nuclear material, um, they are still uh, regarded in a high regard. Please don't transition yet. Um, so one of the, the ways that we understand how Adam Waffen Division and TWP and um, all of these groups communicate is by reading their chat logs. And that's exactly what we've done. We've done this through a thing that we call the Discord leaks. Um, okay, so for those that don't know, Discord is a very popular messenger among gamers, which is also very popular among the alt-right. Uh, it lets you share images, do voice chats, things like that. Um, so we were able to embed ourselves with analysis, uh, to do analysis with Unicorn Riot, which is an alternative media collective and also embed ourselves with the Discord leaks developers. So there are a group of developers that are taking the data that's scraped from Discord and making it available to the public. And we were able to very closely um, interview them and talk to them. Um, and we were able to see them publishing um, a large amount of data. There's almost 500,000 messages published across 17 servers. Um, there are 132 servers that have been scraped. Um, so what does that look like? Um, so there's this technical stack. Uh, there's the DevOps team, which makes and builds packages and distributes their code through Debian packages. Um, they, there is an AWS stack where everything is run in Docker containers, because of course. Um, there's a Reddish caching server um, for uh, queries. Uh, it turns out that Discord leaks is very popular. Even the FBI likes to hit it. Um, <laughs> There's an Nginx routing layer, there's a Python Flask web app, and there's a Postgres container that um, does materialized views because it's very popular. Um, so what does this actually look like? Um, there is displaying the data, there is linking to individual data, so on the, on the far right where you can see view, you can click and see the individual messages and the context around it. Uh, you can do a rudimentary search, you can also see um, people's display names, so like you can see Thomas Ryan of Patriot Front talking to Rama OK, and uh, our scrape data was actually only had the user ID, or sorry, the, there was a string of um, integers that corresponded to the user ID, so there was actually some really complicated reverse engineering of the Discord algorithms uh, to figure out how to do this, so. So it's also important to point out that what we're looking at here is actually data. These conversations are a form of data. But when we talk about data, again, it's not analyzing necessarily the size of the data set. We're thinking about the neo or thinking about the Discord leaks as like a neo-Nazi corpus that we could like use machine learning to analyze harassment. But in fact, we're actually fine-tooth combing through all of the different links and different conversations to see what is being talked about to try to understand future violence that's actively being planned. And we're trying to also look for major trends. So this, this person here, Machine Smitter, who asks, how does doxing work? Uh, they found out. Um, <laughs> uh, the Machine Smitters here actually is good friends with this other person named Hussar, uh, who uh, they travel together to, to, uh, Richard, to run security for Richard Spencer at uh, an event in Michigan. So we saw them coordinating rides and stuff like that together. So we saw that they were good friends. And so we were interested in this person, Hussar, right? Because they're posting photos of their gun. Um, there was leaked audio of them, you know, uh, joking about getting raided by the ATF, and uh, that's exactly what happened. Um, but he was also talking about hanging a federal judge. Um, they, you know, he was wearing Patriot Front gear to his university, and he was reported um, to the ATF. And so what's interesting here is that if we didn't know he was friends with Machine Smitter and Hussar, we didn't know that connection, we couldn't have actually like dropped these documents and like made sense of them. Um, so that's really important. Um, another thing that's important about the Discord leaks is that it prevents people from joining groups. They like really hate that they're getting their 
data leaked. Oh, sorry. Um, so, so yeah, so here's a, a, a message we saw from Don88, who's like, I was gonna join Patreon, or TW, sorry, here's the story. They were going to join um, TWP after Patriot Front's data got leaked, and they were complaining about Patriot Front's data getting leaked. They're saying, I'm gonna join TWP because their data won't get leaked, and a week later, <laughs> you know how that story ends. Um, <clears throat> here's a photo we found in the Discord leaks of Matt Heimbeck again. Um, Matt Heimbeck is going to visit James Field, who's in prison um, for the murder of Heather Heyer, and what was interesting about this photo was that uh, there was another person who was talking to Matt Heimbeck at this time, who calls himself um, Hop Strumfuhr Pepe. Um, some, I don't know. He, he, he thinks he's some high commander of the Pepe army. Um, <laughs> but, but he was the main person who's involved in the anti-communist Discord leak, uh, Discord server that was leaked. Um, Funny how that works. Um, but so what's interesting is that they uh, have fluidity. These people all talk to each other. So even if they're not like all part of the same organizations, they're all on the same servers. So this is where you should then start using big data to start mapping. Um, and again, as we talked about, like these conversations are like a form of data and what we're looking for are major trends. And now that we know what they're talking about, now we can start actually mapping the users and the frequency of who's engaging in these, in these servers. Yeah, so uh, this visualization we took, we just wanted to find all of the users that were in 10% were in or more of the 132 servers that had been scraped. Um, so this is a visualization by Carlos Guerra. Um, he, w he was able to find 22 users that cover 10% um, of all the servers. That doesn't mean that they're all in the same servers, but that means that they're distributed across the system. So of all these 22 users, they cover more than 80% of all the servers. So they're clearly in all of the servers, which is kind of interesting about by itself. Um, but then he visualized sort of this external ring of who they're talking to. And so the ring size is how many messages are posted in that server. And you can see that they're clearly, uh, so the red ones are, uh, they're talking in those servers. The grays, they're not. They're just kind of maybe lurking. Um, but you can see that there is this kind of internal network of people who are maybe key influencers that you might not understand just from like reading usernames. And so we were thinking about that and, and maybe there's some kind of insight that we can gain. Um, there's a lot more research to be done on this. I mean, I think this is a good example of network analysis and network graphing, right? Like we're, being, we're actually able to sort of look at the fluidity amongst power users. Um, but this does bring us up to I think one of our last points. One of the things we're, we've been studying and really trying to focus on, and I think really hammer on home in this talk, is that hate speech is not free speech. Regulation's a really touchy issue. I, am, I don't support regulation of the internet. I believe in net neutrality. But it's important to bring this up when we talk about digital speech, though. Hate speech is not a First Amendment protected activity. We can create norms, great terms of service, and codes of conduct. And this is important to sort of look at and analyze Hate speech is regulated different spaces, or in different countries even, as a separate kind of space. Um, and it's, it's important to bring this up that if we're gonna talk about what does a free and open internet look like, that means we actually have to think about equality and how do we create equality, but then more importantly, how do we preserve equality? In this case, we're talking about norm setting, we're talking about feedback, and we're talking about the kinds of, the kinds of language we wanna have in spaces. And by kinds of language, again, I mean not disagreements, I mean perhaps setting a firm line between hate speech, speech that incites violence. That's different than a disagreement, right? That's not harassment, we're talking about violence, we're talking about language that's designed to marginalize people, we're talking about language that actually says that non-white people are not people. That's not an opinion, that's an ideology, and that's a dangerous ideology. And if we want a safe and equitable internet, if we want an internet for everyone, we have to think about what it means to monitor hate speech and should hate speech exist online. So takeaway lessons. If you wanna do what we do, you have to read a lot of Nazi stuff. A lot. A lot. A lot. So, too oh, much. So much. Oh my God. <laughs> you have to talk to other researchers around the country and around the world about different trends. And then this is really important. We focused a lot on US-based groups, right? Um, there are 
different kinds of political ideological groups that are similar to the United States, but that, that do slightly different things in other parts of the world. Um, so you need to engage with other researchers already doing this. And you need to learn so deeply about internet culture and sweet, sweet may mays <laughs> <laughs> and trends in popular culture because you see this remixed and referenced and mixed again and re-referenced re in all of their conversations. So if you wanna know what they're talking about, if you wanna avoid what Joan Donovan and her team pointed out yesterday with news hacking and source hacking, i.e. Um, like falsely created information that's designed as like plants to confuse journalists and researchers, you also need to know what the authentic content is and you need to see how they're engaging with authentic content, where it's spread and how long it exists inside of a space. I think the Anita Sarkeesian example is really important because Gamergate started in 2014 and it is 2018 and that image is still being referenced. So questions, um, we'll take your questions as long as they're questions. Not statements. Or statements <laughs> phrased as questions. Thank you. Uh, hello? No. Um, I wanted to ask on behalf of um, what do you believe, uh, um, what do you think about the mischaracterization of folks who may be labeled as neo Nazis or those of, uh, or those of the far right in general? Like an example being Mark Meachin, who made a joke, who, whom he obviously doesn't believe in, say, gassing the Jews, but he just made the joke about his dog doing a Nazi salute because he wanted to make some, he wanted to make his dog do something awful because his girlfriend kept taking annoying videos of his dog doing absurd stuff that he never found funny. So to do something, so to do something that wasn't funny, he decided to do that. And he faced among the utmost public defamation and even a court settlement, Sorry, which so he wanted to win. Is your question what happens with edge cases? Basically, my question yeah. is, what so, is your take on people uh, being mislabeled? So yeah, so edge cases. Um, I, they happen and that's unfortunate, right? And I think this is one of the spaces where I think this is where research, deep research is important. Did people go back through and look at perhaps all of his tweets? Did they go and analyze the context of it? I think this is where Con contextual research is really important. Um, I think most researchers in the room would agree with that. I think perhaps that case is more of an example of media and society sort of reacting or looking for a story. But I also want to highlight that you are giving one edge case. Yes. Um, and that that doesn't happen all the time. And I think when we have these conversations around if X equals Y, sometimes they don't equal that, right? Edge cases happen, I had a they do, but that's not evocative of every, every kind of um, action that can occur. But it had to do and we see this kind of argument frequently when we're discussing online harassment. If someone says one thing, it could be another. Um, I appreciate the question, but I think it is important to highlight that context is important and that is also an edge case. Mike, Thank you very much for your talk. Um, it's great um, to hear, well, <laughs> some of what's going on, and it's great to hear some of what's, what shouldn't be going on. Um, so my question was, uh, basically, considering all this shit that we've seen, uh, what is our roles and responsibilities as hackers and activists, and how can we do better? Do you want to take this? Oh. <laughs> do I want to take this? Um, <laughs> Uh, my, f so, so there's some interesting, um, research on how social norms actually take place in cultures, and it really only requires something like 20, 25% of people, like, taking a firm stance to say that this shit's not acceptable before it, um, becomes part of the community, and it actually doesn't take very long. Um, another thing that's important is that, um, uh, I mean, I, one thing that I found in our research that is maybe not related to sort of the hope context, but is related to the larger um, you know, uh, alt-right context is platforms don't give a shit about specific 
content until a reporter starts calling, um, and that's really fucked up. Um, but that is the case, and it's really important to know that. Um, so uh, that was that was gonna be my suggestion: is can you so it's like scrape scraping and leaking? Can you send stuff to different journalists, different reporters? Can you offer your services? Um, a lot of newsrooms, researchers, activists, they often don't have the time or the infrastructure to do a lot of this, 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 uh, this they have, well, they don't have, an, sometimes they don't have the time or the funding to actually scrape. Sometimes what they actually need is technical support. Um, if you're looking for specific places, we can, maybe after the talk we can all brainstorm together. I know of different people that prob that need some technical help. Hi, um, my question is: I've only kind of become aware of this alt right wave in the past couple years, and and I'm wondering, like, from a historical view, is this something that's kind of like new in America, like, it, or is is it just like a more visibility something that was already there? Can you just talk about like the historical? You know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, now, if you know? Um, I, I, that's a great question, and thank you for asking. Um, I think, you know, the alt-right is not, the, the, I think the name is a recent phenomenon because it comes out of a specific pub uh, publication that Richard Spencer wrote. But we've had the establishment of white nationalism in the United States for an incredibly long time. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center's hate files very much gets into this. They've been documenting different forms of white supremacist groups, white nationalist groups, extremist groups, far right militias, etc. And a lot and um, the historical prevalence of these. So there's a couple different groups that I've been looking at that started to exist in the 1960s. Um, so it just, they're like, racism is I think part of the backbone of America and we've had, we've, we've had inequality for a really long time. Specifically the ideology of the alt-right is a new phrase that came from a specific publication that Richard Spencer ran, but uh, white nationalism has been in America for a very long time. And Southern Poverty Law Center has a lot of really great information on that, if you're curious. Um, I sort of have two questions. Uh, well, they're, they're brief. But one is I see a push and pull between the idea of um, trying not to have a lot of people gathering in these uh, online spaces to then commit violence, but also uh, since you guys can study what has been going on when they are congregating in a way that we have that you have access to. So if you see a push and pull there, or there's a, a little bit of preference to allow them so that we can understand what's going on instead of them being completely dark and, you know, and what we otherwise support, which is encryption, encrypted communications, um, so they can follow that. And then the second part is if you've seen a lot of sabotage campaigns of like trying to flood with bad data, like people trying to make groups and then, hey, go do this thing at this place, but then it doesn't exist. and I don't know if that, I heard one or two instances of that, and if that right. is something that could happen a lot. Um, I'm, I'm gonna answer the yeah, first yeah, one. Um, I'm gonna quote Chelsea Manning that information wants to leak. Uh -huh. um, but, and I think that that's really important information spreads, but I think uh, there's always been private spaces that different alt-right groups have congregated in. There's probably plenty of SMS messages that we're not privy to. Um, but when you're organizing a large group and you're using uh, software as the way to organize, if you're using the internet, like digital infrastructure, part of that will always be public because you're trying to organize a, la a large group. And I think this is where Gamer Gamergate is a great use case. They would actively archive and create lists of certain things because they had to disseminate information to many people and at, at, at specific times. And that's why like, there was this congregation inside of Reddit. That's why I think the, um, you see the alt-right on Discord or Gab. And those are somewhat sem semi-closed spaces, but even still, like, that information gets out. So I think... Um, I'm not so much worried about if we, rem if we keep pushing them out, they'll go completely underground. Um, one, historically, a lot of white nationalist groups, they're not necessarily underground. They are very public. They host panels and talks and forums, and they fundraise, and they take money, and they write publications. And I think we see this also a lot in the alt-right. They have PewTube. They are organizing on Patreon. Um, and a lot of this is like, also the bread and butter of being a celebrity or trying to push an ideology out there. They still actually have to have a platform. So I guess the TLDR to your question is, there will always be large 
large parts of what is done by different kinds of groups that will be made public because they have to disseminate that knowledge to the outer fringes of the group. So people that are in the ideology that may not be in the private spaces. And, and I want to finish that a little bit. Um, the reason that Discord is such a good pl place for information is that it's sort of, again, semi-public, but they still need to be talking to each other. Um, and I didn't get to this, but one of the reasons that they cannot stop the leaks is because um, they're always trying to, can you, no one can see that slide. Um, there, was this, yeah, is, there was a joke, doesn't matter. There we go. Um, <laughs> um, one of the reasons that, it, uh, that Discord is so important and one of the reasons that the alt-right can't spike with bad data is because they always need to be recruiting new, new members and they always need to be um, sort of getting new faces in. And so ne they'll never be able to stop the leaks. And even if they want to do disinformation campaigns, which they do, um, at some point they have to spill the real shit online. And that's why Discord is actually a, like one of these nice target rich environments. If it's helpful to think about, think about how you would, how you would inform everyone in this room of something. Like we all wouldn't fit into one signal channel. Um, so you'd probably tell certain people and you'd play a game of telephone and then at some point someone would decide to make something public. And that's, I think, a good metaphor to think about how information spreads inside of groups where they have varying forms of private and non-private communication. So we have time for maybe two, call, two more questions. All right. Um, two short questions. Uh, well, well, like, we're going to count that as one. Okay. Um, well, Anna statement one, I'm Jewish. I've been called a Nazi by someone who appears to um, very flippantly use that label. And I found great offense to that since my grandfather had his family killed in the Holocaust. Two, um, have you heard of an individual called Joshua Goldberg, a troll who both had an alt-right persona and wrote for Jezebel, calling out his alt-right persona, although he pretended to be two different people. His goal was essentially to inflame the entire conflict to make each, each side go at each other's throats. Yeah. Have, you ever, have, you heard, have you heard of J Joshua Goldberg? Yes. All right. <laughs> Can we have, are there any women or people of color that want to ask a question? Since we, since we, only have time for one more. This is actually a double woman question because I'm, yes. I'm asking on behalf of Gabriella Coleman on Twitter. Woo. Woo. <laughs> after the Discord leaks, did people burrow more underground, get better at OPSEC? Were you able to follow after? Can someone ask this for me? Um, Freddie has a bunch of funny screenshots about them asking about what is doxing and also like how signal works. Yeah, um, the, the answer <laughs> is no. They have not gotten better at OPSEC. Um, because they're always, always, always trying to recruit. Um, they uh, have tried to move to, like, so for example, the Unite the Right 2.0 um, rally, uh, which is supposed to be in Washington, D.C. now, August 12th, go and kind of protest. Um, they, um, they went to a Facebook Messenger chat, and that was promptly leaked. And then another person promptly leaked another version of the Facebook Messenger. So no matter what platform they're on, they're also talking about going to Riot or, or whatever, and maybe we're going to use another encrypted messenger. Um, they, it doesn't matter. Um, so they're not going more underground. They're just... Um, it's like they're going almost more sideways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sideways is the best way to describe What's it. What's your last question? No, no more oh, well, well. Someone stole the microphone. No, no, uh, okay. so, right. no, no uh, well, you asked for uh, one last question, but we have a person of no, color. No, there are no more. Oh, really? Okay. We have a person of color, and we thought uh, right. we, we should take the opportunity. This, is, this feels a little weird to, to say what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, you asked for a person of color. You got a two for I'm also gay. Um, <laughs> all right. So that said, I do have a kind of a security question. Uh, you made a statement about hate speech is not free speech, and to a large extent, I agree. My concern, though, is kind of understanding how norms and ethics change within a society over time. If you build an apparatus to kind of, I won't use the word police, but to analyze, study, and defeat different isms, how do you protect that apparatus when the norms change and they come back at you? 
I, with questions like this, I always ask people to imagine a specific scenario and work backwards. And I am trying to think of a scenario in, in which maybe, maybe the most obvious one is what's unfolding right now, right? So how, what, like a terms of service, how is it written, how is it enforced, and what is it sort of pulling from? Uh, a lot of terms of service are based off pre-existing legislature or law um, because it's running through policy. Um, so how far would norms have to shift for a, a code of conduct that is enforced um, that would have to radically change to not affect our norms? Um, I understand a, a lot of these questions um, can perhaps come from fear or uncertainty. And I wonder if a lot of that's because we don't actually see the practice of things enforced, meaning we don't actually see the system or mechanism working. We don't see the apparatus functioning the way it should. But if we look at this, uh, if we look at a terms of service or a code of conduct, the way it's defined now, is it something we would all stand behind? I think that there are plenty of ones, and I like to sort of point actually to the JavaScript community and the, the JS conferences, one for having a great code of conduct and two for enforcing them. We see the apparatus working, and we see even while culture is trying to shift around it, that it does stand firm, and it stands firm because it's designed to protect the community. It's also designed to protect those most vulnerable in the community. And then it's held up by evangelists in the community. It's held up by different people that maybe don't stand up and vocalize their thoughts or opinions. Um, this is why I like things like a code of conduct or a manifesto or terms of service that are things we agree to. Um, I think it can be actually much harder than we think to completely shift when we have that kind of infrastructure, when we have something like, again, a COC that we've all agreed to. I'm sorry, we're, we're taking, done. Yeah. we are taking, sorry. Okay. We are taking more questions down the hall in the, in the NES room, uh, just past the uh, elevators on the left. So uh, if you have more questions, they'll be, you can, you can meet yeah, with we'll them, there are more questions. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much.